Welcome to the School Site Corner. I'm your host, Joe Sims. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing with Miss Casey Johnson. And Casey Johnson, she's a school psychologist in the state of South Carolina, and she's agreed to have a little chat with us today. So I want to let her tell her, um, tell a little bit about herself and how she actually impacts students in a K-12 setting, just as a brief overview. Yeah, um, so as just said, my name is uh, Casey Johnson. Um, I've been working in South Carolina for three years. And a lot of what I do or the cases that I do get have to do with kids with learning disabilities and ADHD. Those are kind of the bread and butter of what come across my desk. But um, yeah, many of the times the kids will show up with early deficits in phonological awareness which is their ability to hear and perceive individual sounds. And they have a lot of difficulty matching that to print. Um, so we try to give them at intervention. I'm lucky to be at a school where they have really good um, intervention services. So it's just an extra support on top of what they're getting in general ed. And then if that doesn't work after a certain time, they're referred to me and then we do more in-depth testing to see if there's some sort of learning disability. But I'm also consulting a lot with teachers and trying to pinpoint what's specifically going wrong with their reading. Okay, nice. And the reason I asked you on is last week episode on the podcast, I talked about developmental delays. And I was very curious as to, you know, someone who sees children in the capacity that you see them. Um, like, what's your take on the relationship between developmental delays in certain areas and then learning disabilities? Because as a child gets older, we know that, you know, the developmental delays eventually phase out into more or difficulties in the classroom. And so what's your take on that? Yeah, a lot of the developmental delays, we put that label on them when we know there's something off, but we're not quite sure what it is. Because the brain is developing in such a, I want to say chaotic, but there's a lot of uneven development. Some kids have more accelerated development in certain areas of the brain and others don't. Um, and so usually we can kind of flush that out by second grade. Um, that's when they've had enough reading instruction to really tease out what it is. But a lot of times the initial developmental delays that I do have to do with autism, but I actually just did one today. So perfect question. There we that go. Had a developmental delay and we switched it to a learning disability. Um, he also had some co-occurring attention difficulties, but it was interesting when I tested him, he, he was getting um, support across all areas, reading, writing, and math. But when I tested him on, you know, our assessments do measure more what's developmentally appropriate or instead of what a grade is. So if you look at his grades, he does need help across the board. But on my assessments, reading was actually his strength and math was his weakness. So he showed more of a dysgraphia pattern. Okay. A learning disability in math. So we've switched it to that. But a lot of some of the attention and motivation issues, um, which a lot of times co occur with learning disabilities, um, the, those were making his grades look all flat across the board. But when we think of a specific learning disability, we think it's specific to one area. So sometimes it doesn't. He's in second grade. So I feel like um, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but as they get older, it's easier to flush out. Um, and especially because if they're under developmental delay, they're getting services. And if they're still not learning, and that's what essentially dyslexia is, is when you've given them the best services possible, the best evidence-based instruction, which is explicit direct in instruction in phonics, um, then, and they're still not picking up the pace, but after a couple of years, that's a really good indicator of the learning disability. Okay. And you kind of talked about something, um, you said it's called specific learning disability, but you kind of see it, or I guess this kid you worked with more globally to where there are multiple areas. And so how often do you see like the, like you said, attention plays a piece in how it factors with their learning. How often do you see those developmental delays, if you will, like go across multiple areas and then now you're dealing with attention difficulties along with reading difficulties? I think they um, play a they, I, I want to say like 50% of the time, um, there's usually like it's, um, you know, we get the rating scales back. And then you can also notice that those kids with learning disabilities have a difficult time self-monitoring because mm -hmm. that when you're learning to read, you have to be able to think about 
what you're reading. Are you sounding it out right? Are you comprehending it? And that plays a big role in attentional control. So I would, yeah, I, just off the cuff, I would say about 50% of the time. Okay. Um, and sometimes they do come in with a diagnosis and sometimes I see it on the rating scales. Okay. So. I think that just opens up the door to say it's not as clear cut as it may have seemed to be. And that's something that you and I, we've um, talked about previously, you know, new ways of looking at what learning disabilities are. And you talked about trying different interventions, trying things over and over and still not seeing the growth. And then you move forward with certain uh, assessments or interventions at the next level. But how much effort and time should be given to some of those foundational skills before you call it a quits and just say, oh, there's a disability as opposed to just the effort and the skill of learning? I think we should put most of our effort in there and into the preloading them with all of that information. And I mean, there's a, a spectrum of learning disabilities too. Like I think a lot of us walk around having some sort of reading difficulty. Like I noticed for myself, um, I always have to read things multiple times before I comprehend it. But that's a strategy that I know that's not necessarily to say that I have a reading comprehension difficulty. But um, it, according to the research, um, even kids, that have lower IQs can learn to read when they're given adequate time and instruction. Um, but I would say at least several years before, so starting maybe in kindergarten, first grade and second grade, I don't really like to identify them prior to that as, I, as we know some of the um, areas in the brain that have to do with like language development and speech aren't completely myelinated. Mm. So, it's just going to take some time. And especially with boys, I've noticed they uh, tend to learn to read a little bit later. But I feel like once you've ruled out adequate instruction, and you can even um, do that just by talking to your school about their curriculum. Like I learned recently learned, and this is going a little bit on a tangent, that our um, curriculum does really good with teaching kids phonological awareness. So that's just hearing the individual sounds, but they don't do, when it comes to phonics, which is the next step, and it's matching that um, sound unit to the print, they, the curriculum just doesn't um, do a good job at explicitly and directingly and um, explicit and direct instruction in that area. So we have a lot of kids by third grade that are kind of behind. Um, that's where we start seeing them fall through the cracks. And the special ed teachers see that on our assessments, it's that, that phonics part, they're just all missing it. OK. And you t I mean, something I took from some notes. Um, first off, you've spent numerous hours like learning about what these disabilities are and honing your skills into the point. It just bleeds through you right now. And that's really why I have you on here. And so um, looking at the three levels of reading development, you talked about them naturally. So you have the letter sound as the first stage, phonic mm -hmm. decoding and then the orthographic mapping. And mm -hmm. so with these beginning stages, if there's quote unquote, some weakness in one of these areas, are you likely to see some difficulties as the child learns to read? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. And the reason I ask that is because another part of the literature and the things that you've been studying, I took notes. Um, mm -hmm. It says that students need to develop good phonics decoding skills. That's one. Mm -hmm. Number two is weak readers, they develop um, a capacity to easily remember the words they read. So being able to identify sight words, but in order for them to identify the sight word, they have to be exposed dozens of times yeah. as opposed to like maybe two or three times as, you know, someone that's typically developing. And so that that's a lot in itself. So you're going to have to do more significantly more just to have, you know, that um, general level of ability to learn how to read. Yeah. So it's going to take them a lot longer. And um, I think um, the, the research said like a typical kid, it takes one to four exposures, but it could take dozens for a slower reader. That's correct. And something that I talk a lot about with my parents that I work with and just people listening is the ETG mindset. So embracing the grind. And that sometimes means doing things that are hard. So if you have a parent such as the ones listening and it's like, okay, I'm going to have to put in this amount of time to help my kid that's struggling to read, read, like what kind of things might you suggest to them or give them as far as pointers when they're going through this? Because they have, you know, 
dedicated themselves to embracing the grind and developing their child's reading, even if it is dozens of times, what would you share with them? Um, well, from a young age, I think they should start their kids off just by talking a lot with them um, and just exposing them to a wide variety of vocabulary words. So just talking to them like you would another adult, um, I would discourage that, you know, uh, baby talk speech. Uh, maybe uh, when they're, you know, fresh out of the womb, you can, but later on. Discourage it? Yeah, I would discourage it after a certain point um, because that all of um, the more exposure they have to a variety of um, sounds of language, it's going to be easier for them by the time they get into school to match that to print. Mm. And then immediately start exposing them to words because it's just going to get easier for them to make that correlation between what you're saying and then also what you're saying and even using your finger to read along. So they're just making those connections. So they're going to have a head start in school. Mm. And then also, sorry, um, I was just going to say along with the reading and tracking, that was something that was pounded in my head early on is the more you read with the child, the younger they are, the greater their ability to read becomes. And so it's like, just take the time to do that. So simple. Yeah. While you're at it, track the word to help them, you know, monitor what the words are. Mm hmm. Yeah, and I, um, I remember my dad, too, it was, um, I'd say every day after school, I had to read with him, and we rely a lot on technology to teach kids, but I think just that engagement, um, there's a huge component, so just sitting down with your, your kid and reading with them, and yeah, tracking your fingers so they know, as you're saying the sound, what part of the word is that making, and then go back over it. Like, one thing I did, this is more of a... Um, a part of speech, but with, um, or a language thing, but with my dad always told me with question marks, you, you say, uh, like to say you're asking a question, like you kind of inflect your voice a little yeah, bit. Of speech. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So I just remember just stuff like that, those little things you can do, um, to enforce it. And then I want to also, I think there's a lot of pressure on kids these days to, and there's so much, by the time they're even in second grade and I get them, they're so anxious. So just being calm and patient with them Mm. and repetition really, and being calm and compassionate because the anxiety that is going around today is just so hard. And, you know, we push testing so much in school with our iReady and district assessments that they're already so self-conscious of it, but just let them know that they're doing a good job and they just need to do the best that they can. So I think those that level of anxiety can impair a lot of it too. Yeah. And maybe because there is so much pressure at school, I'm just thinking um, when a kid comes home, it's like, obviously I've worked on this all day at school. Mm-hmm. Now I have to get home and work on it with mom, dad. And so it's like, oh my goodness. But that could be the great opportunity to, you know, switch up the vibe a little bit you know, take some of their strengths off, make it more enjoyable, um, create some kind of activity game around it, even just so that it's not as anxiety provoking as you're talking about, because I'm struggling to read, but I don't know how to read, but I'm being forced to read. And it's just like, okay, mommy, daddy understands this is something I'm working on. Take a deep breath, enjoy yourself. Yeah. And I think you can pair it with like a relationship building tool. Like this is just our activity that we do together. Mm. I think that, um, Instead of, and I know it, it's hard um, because, you know, parents are tired when they get home from work and it's easy just to put them on an iPad. And now there's all these games that help you read. But I think that relationship component is really big to help them enable the reading process. That's, that's the key right there. Um, nothing wrong with the iPad or tablet time, as I call it, but it's more about the restraint and being able to supplement it with some, you know, human to human contact. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, Miss Casey, um, Miss Johnson, do you have anything else that you feel is important in just understanding, I guess, some basic level learning disabilities? You talked about dyscalculia earlier. Is that something you see more of now or is that something on the rise? Um, I think the prevalence, well, from what I've read, the prevalence rate of reading disabilities is um, a lot higher than dysgraphia. Exactly. Or not dysgraphia, that um, dyscalculia. But I, I would just say that not, um, I want to, I, what I would want, I guess, parents to know is that there is a, a spectrum of reading difficulties, but not everyone needs a label of special education. Mm-hmm. And that I think we need to just 
do what we can, practice with the kids. Um, and then after several years, then maybe, we, you know, a label may be appropriate. But a lot of times I feel like their parents are just so quick to say something is wrong if by kindergarten they don't have their letters to sounds. You know, it, it's just, um, and I'm, as I said, the, this past year I've worked with a, a few kindergartners and the parents are quite flustered. And also in South Carolina, the state standards are just so high that they're expected to learn, you know, CBC words, which is consonant vowel, consonant words mm -hmm. in kindergarten. And that's not always developmentally appropriate. So I would say just um, continue to practice and let your kid take their time and learn at their own rate. And don't be so quick to um, get distressed if they're taking a little bit of time because it's actually language is natural for the brain to learn, but reading isn't. It takes so many different parts of the brain. It lights up so many areas and they all have to be evenly developed, myelinated and um, working together. So I think that's the best thing that we can do instead of so quickly, you know, saying that there's something off. Yeah. Can you say that one more time? Just because when you said it, it was like a jolt, you said, <laughs> um, language is easy, but reading is the challenge or something. Yeah. Like that. yeah so our, our brains, um, you know, being an the animals that we are, language is integral to every species, really, for yeah. most species. Um, everybody's talking to each other. It's how we communicate. It's a very old structure in our brain to talk and um, express ourselves, understand language. It's our survival mechanism. But reading is a newly developed um, part of our brain, and it just takes a lot of intentional effort. So a lot of the curriculums and uh, teacher assumptions are if I just expose them enough, they're just going to get it. That's the implicit learning style. But research has shown that that is not correct. Kids need to be taught the explicit um, phonics. So the PH, for example, makes the F sound. The um, Every time the E is at the end, it makes the vowel say its name. Those you know, little uh, mnemonic techniques, like those have to be taught to the kid. And um, so it's gonna just take a lot of intentional effort. It's not just, some kids after repeated exposure to reading, they can just kind of pick up on it, but otherwise they need intentional instruction. Mm -hmm. Something I'm, I'm thinking about now is, I take a lot of things for granted until I come across it and then I'm just kind of taken aback. And so, I wonder how in tune I would be with like phonological awareness and understanding what that was if I wasn't exposed to it so much. So as a parent, if I'm looking to try to teach these phonics skills, could it be as simple as just Googling, you know, phonics and then just going over a list or something? Or is there some kind of curriculum I need to adapt in order to teach my child how to develop their phonics skills? Mm -hmm. um, well, early on, like the phonological awareness um, that's actually why nursery rhymes are so popular. All of the, they have um, interesting, the just rhyming in general and just say, and in, in music too, um, there's a lot of um, just words that kind of flow off your tongue and it sounds nice, but um, just early exposure to rhymes and poems and stuff like that can help build it. But um, there's a lot of resources out there. Reading Rocket, okay. I really love like. um, that I would say is probably the number one website for getting more information on, on teaching phonics, but you will come across it even when you're reading to your kid and they uh, pronounce one part of the, the word um, recently. And you can kind of review the, the word with them with how it's properly pronounced. Um, what was, I'm just trying to think of an example. Um, and then also this is um, an example of how um, hard reading is too. And I think we forget that because as adults, it's just so automatic and we don't, I mean, I don't, I'm in my thirties and I barely remember what it was like to learn how to read. It just kind of happened. Yeah. Um, but the other day I was doing an observation for a, um, a kid that I suspect has dyslexia and they said the word mother instead of mother. And I don't really know, there's not really a rule that I can point to because it's not the E at the end that makes the vowel say its name. It just sounds like an uh, like it sounds like a U. Yeah. But it's an o. So there's just in the English language, we need to be more sympathetic, like especially <laughs> there's just so many Take it uh, there's so many rules. And I was like, you know, technically that kiddo is not incorrect. <laughs> I mean it 
why wouldn't it be mother instead mm-hmm. of mother? And you uh, see that a lot when kids rely on that um, phonetic awareness, that ability, when they rely on that, they can read long words, even if mm-hmm. they don't know what they are. They could just blend the sounds together and make make it sound good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, so yeah, reading, and, and that's a good resource, but just um, reinforcing how it is pronounced um, and sounding it out for them. And then one thing um, I've noticed um, what really good, our good um, reading teachers do is they have them say out each sound and then prompt the kid, okay, now blend it together and cueing them to do it. And then um, instead of just giving the word to them. So I think we, it is very um, sometimes painful to hear our kids, especially your own kids, um, and just laboriously sound out the word and still not be able to get it. Yeah. So just say with a cough, like a, a soft, patient approach, just like, okay, now try to say it all together, blend it together. That's a good approach um, to getting them to learn how to read. And even like you can support them, okay, what does that sound and isolation sound like? And um, that could work, but I do see a lot of parents and teachers just giving it to them instead mm-hmm. of just like giving them that time and space. And if they are on some spectrum of the learning disability, it is going to take them a little bit more time, but I think we need to give them that room to breathe. Yeah. And that um, same mindset where you say you're not too quick to jump in. It's like, let them struggle a little bit because they'll benefit more from it on the back end when they can actually read the word as opposed to having it given to them. So exactly. And it'll, um, you know, as you said, embrace the grind, like life is hard. Um, Mm -hmm. It's, (laughs) it's, (laughs) I mean, every day I think, wow, this is hard. I want to take a nap. (laughs) (laughs) So if they can learn to overcome that distress at an early age, that will be, that will benefit them the rest of their lives. Um, And, you know, I, I've talked to you a lot about this, Joe, but I struggled in school a lot and I always had to work extra hard to get ahead. And then by the time I got to college, um, it was actually kind of a breeze for me because I already had all those study skills. Mm. My older brother, he was just naturally gifted and didn't have to study. And then he started failing. And then all of a sudden I was soaring and it's just because I had to work hard. So (laughs) flex it on. (laughs) Yeah. So they, um, and then even, um, is an example, like not, even if your kiddo struggles in elementary school, um, it's not always predictive of how they're going to do later on. And this reading thing, it's important, but it's one piece of the puzzle that makes up the whole child. Um, Motivation, effort, and just being a good, you know, somebody of good values and a good hearted um, individual, because you can be a smart, brilliant, expert reader, but if you don't have those social skills, those interpersonal skills, you're, you're not going to succeed at life. I hate to say it because we're all going to have to deal with people. Yeah. So I like, um, that's something that I try to hone in when there is some sort of learning deficit. It's not the complete picture. Just try to support them as you can, but there's so many other facets to kids that make them wonderful. And then one other thing, um, sometimes I think creative kids are not really rule-based and a lot of um, reading is very rule-based. So sometimes I think kids just have a, those creative ones may struggle a little bit more in school, but then they may be later on their gifts will come to fruition. They just may not get this rigid system of education that they're in. And that's all right. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Well, um, Ms. Johnson, thank you for sharing your wisdom, expertise, things that you are just developing yourself on. Thank you for sharing with our audience. Um, I do want to be respectful of your time and I hope everyone has enjoyed this because I know I have, and I'm like kind of juiced to go practice some of this with my youngest daughter, my my oldest daughter. Um, She's three years old. And some of these phonics skills are exciting because I can create games around them (laughs) and she'll be learning these early skills. So thank you for joining us. And um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Joe. Awesome. Until next time, you guys take care.